right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Inside Sports Studio for another edition of Football Talk. Hard to believe we're already at week 10, but we're going to go ahead and get right into it. All of the uh, surprises, the thrills, who's good, who's bad, who is just a flat-out disappointment. Last week we did the NFC. This week it's the AFC, and we're going to talk about it all. Can't do it myself, though. i got to have my partner in. So here comes, without further ado, you follow him on Twitter, at Chris L Sports. And also, many of you uh, read his fantastic columns on footballnation.com. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Chris Lardieri. Chris, what's happening? Charles, as always, thank you for the fantastic introduction. Uh, another great week of football behind us and uh, another one to look forward to, and let's get at it. All right. Well, first of all, we've got to give you your props. You know, and that is footballnation.com. And I've been catching the last few columns. I like your style and everything. So what can we look forward to this week? You know, I had a I had an idea for a column written up. It was going to be about Thursday Night Football. I won't spoil it because I'm going to save it for later in the year. But um, I had this idea in the last couple of days after reading that Jerry Jones was locked out of the Cowboys locker room after the loss to the Falcons on Sunday night, and he was banging on the door. And then it just seems like a whole can of worms is open this week. Uh former head coach Jimmy Johnson went on with Dan Patrick yesterday and said that uh, basically Jerry Jones is full of you-know-what, that he had all final say in personnel matters, and he was the last coach to have that in his contract, and he could show him. And, um, you know, then Barry Switzer fired back, and uh, there's just been a lot of buzz about Jerry Jones lately, and we, we kind of hit on this a few weeks ago. We were ahead of the curve. Is he really the next Al Davis? Do, do good coaches really want to go down there in Dallas? when he controls everything soup to nuts and the coaches are somewhat of a proverbial puppet. So my next column, which uh, we'll be hitting tomorrow, be be about that. You know, should Jerry Jones be locked out of the Cowboys locker room per se? Um, it's, it's really interesting because now you're hearing a lot of people say that maybe with uh, Sean Payton's contract being voided down in New Orleans, uh-huh. he lives in Dallas, he was the offensive coordinator under Parcells, could he go there? If I'm Sean Payton, I don't know if I want to work for Jerry Jones. If I'm uh, John Gruden, do I come out of semi-retirement to, to go work for Jones? I, I think not. He's it's almost becoming like a 1980s George Steinbrenner, or a 90s and 2000s version of Al Davis. Yeah, there you go. And it, that was the other thing about uh, Sean Payton or any coach. You know, no matter how good you are, when you get there to Dallas, you're going to be stripped of all your power and really all your influence that you have on the team. So it doesn't really matter what kind of resume you bring in there, and that is whether you're Jason Garrett, you're Bar- Bill Parcells, you're, you're uh, whomever. If you go in there to Dallas, it's, it's basically over because you're not going to be the one running the team. I think it's time for Jerry Jones to come down from the box, give himself yet another title and that of head coach, and go ahead and fulfill his dream of actually coaching the team, then realizing how difficult that is, and then he maybe he'll get his old butt back up to the owner's box where he belongs and let those guys do their jobs. The one thing you can say about Al, De- Al Davis is at least he did coach before, you know, but Jerry Jones is just a, uh, you know, worn-out old football player with a lot of money and, and a dream of, of owning a team, which he has, but, you know. Yeah, he could ask Ted Turner how that went, you know, briefly manage the Atlanta Braves. It doesn't work out well. There you go. All right, so let's get into it. We're at week 10 now, but uh, week 9, I got to say that the best thing was uh, the rookies really came to the forefront in week 9, and the rampaging rookies, Douglas Martin, 251 yards and four TDs, 251 yards on the ground against Oakland, four TDs, Andrew Luck, Playing against Miami, 433 yards through the air, two TDs, no interceptions. And one thing I liked about that game with, uh, you know, with the Miami game, you know, I, I love the Dolphins, but I loved watching that game because when I saw Andrew Luck, I saw a certain poise with him. And I just thought, man, I'm going to get to watch this guy for the next 10, 15 years or however long his career is. And that's just going to be fantastic. Yeah, and I know it's early, but very quickly, halfway through the season, you're really not hearing any sort of second-guessing of the Colts letting Peyton Manning go and drafting Andrew Luck. Um, If anything, it looks like all things being equal and barring any injuries, etc., they've got themselves another Peyton Manning. Uh, He just looks pro-ready. He's a big guy. He reads defenses. I think what's most impressive is he really doesn't have a heck of a lot of talent around him, a lot of a lot of 
prognosticators in the NFL thought maybe the Colts will only win a handful of games this year. And now, look, they got a winning record uh, after beating up Jacksonville tonight. I mean, they keep at it. They they might sneak in as a wild card or at least uh, – it could, could at least, worst case scenario, maybe end up with a 500 record with uh, a team that basically has Reggie Wayne and a bunch of uh, unknowns on offense. Yeah, it's true. And we look at that. They beat Jacksonville tonight as we, you know, we tape on Thursday instead of Wednesday when we normally do. But, uh, yeah, they beat Jacksonville, and that's their fourth win in a row. So he's really hit stride right now. And, you know, I like the, the smoothness of that game against the Dolphins. Really, not for both those teams, the Dolphins being a surprise in the AFC as well. But the smoothness and the poise of both those teams is what I really liked in that game. Yeah, and some people going in kind of tongue-in-cheek said it could be a playoff preview. Who knows? It may very well be. Yeah. They, they played like it, that's for sure. Okay, and what about uh, Douglas Martin and the, you know, uh, here he comes out of Boise State, relatively uh, unknown, and here he's tearing it up, and you look at his – totals over the last few weeks these last four games he's gained over he's gained over 500 yards and really just seems to be hitting stride and how did he get under the radar by the way yeah i'm not sure i mean yours truly being a, an unabashed giants fan was sitting there watching the draft and hoping he would fall to him knowing the giants <laughs> needed a running back to replace the uh late great grandin brandon jacobs i say that late great as, a, as his career um and uh, there there go the buccaneers right in front of the giants and snap him up i seen him play on the blue field up in boise a few times thought he was good he kind of stock kind of rose after the combine i i thought he you know i, I thought he'd amount to being a good back but he's just this is reminiscent of when Adrian Peterson came out of Oklahoma. He's just tearing it up, and he's not a big guy either, which is even more impressive. So uh, I think the Buccaneers got themselves a steal there. Yeah, there we go. And, uh, you know, they're starting to hit stride as well. But we did NFC last week. Let's go ahead and get to the uh, AFC preview, and then later on in the segment we got our pick segment coming up. And, by the way, just want to let you know we're doing pretty well here on this show with our picks lately. But let's go ahead and preview the uh AFC midseason, the top three, we got to go with, and uh, Chris and I talked about this, Houston, number one, the Denver Broncos, this is where uh, really Mr. Lardieri puts them at number two, and then kind of a tie for third between the Steelers and the uh, and the Baltimore Ravens, the Steelers at five and three, the Ravens at six and two, but the Ravens kind of riddled with injuries, so we'll go ahead and take them top to bottom. Let's talk about the Houston Texans. Of course, a big tilt coming up this week against Chicago, but uh, what do you see with Houston? You know, Houston playing in that, that week, AFC South, really I don't see anyone posing any sort of roadblock between them getting home field, like, like I said earlier, barring any injuries, anything unforeseen. Um, but good test this week against Chicago, uh, going up there into Soldier Field. Let's see how they perform. Last time they went into Denver and, and spanked the Broncos pretty well. So should be a good game. you got two good defenses, two good running games. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately might come down to quarterback play. But uh, really, who would have thought the, the only other potential roadblock could be the Colts? Let's see uh, if they put up a fight against the Texans. But um, it's not so. I mean, the, the, the Texans are a good team. But it's more a function of their, their ease of schedule and the fact that if they keep running up wins, they're going to have a couple home games in January, potentially. Right, and, and the other thing about them is that the amazing thing is you would think that it would come down to, you know, Andre Johnson having a great season as well for them to get off to a start. I mean, 7-1 and one at the halfway mark, but Andre Johnson has not had the most uh, stellar season in the world here. But Arian Foster's been good, and the defense. Here you have the defense. Brian Cushing goes out, which you think should be should really disrupt, destroy things on defense. And now, but they've just stepped up as a unit. And what can you say about J.J. Watt or J.J. Swat, as they call him? You know, <laughs> on the defensive line, they're making a push for defensive player of the year. So something is coming together, and maybe something special happening there in Houston. Yeah, you know, um, they also lost to Nico Ryans and Mario Williams in the offseason. Right. And they just completely reload in the draft. Um, and, and that Wade Phillips 3-4, I mean, say what you will about him as a head coach. The guy knows what he's doing as a defensive coordinator. Um, right. No matter who they plug in there, that, that, that team plays well. All right, so, you know, let's go to the Broncos here. Now, the Broncos are 5-3. and three. But they have won three in a row, so they, they got a little bit of a shaky start and got their butts whipped a couple of times. But seemed like when they came back from that 24 to nothing halftime deficit 
against San Diego. And, uh, you know, really they've been kind of rolling since then, and Peyton Manning seems to be really settling in there in Denver. Yeah, definitely, and I, I put them as a number two team for a couple of reasons. One, they're they're clearly the class of the AFC West. I don't see the Chargers putting up much of a fight. And two, Peyton Manning is is really starting to hit stride. I mean, for him to look rusty, even that game against Atlanta, where he only rallied the troops back to victory. Uh, well, let's see what happens when he gets a little bit of the arm strength back. It's even more comfortable with with the the offense and his receiving core. Um, I just think, you know, going up there, playing in Denver in the winter and uh, heading into the winter, and I was a skeptic, I admit it. I didn't think they'd win the division, but um, <laughs> he does not look like a man who's missed the season, had multiple neck surgeries. Okay, and then we got to go down to, uh, you know, the tied for third. We talk about the Ravens and the Steelers. Ravens are 6-2 and two and leading the AFC North. Steelers right behind them at 5-3. and three. Steelers have won three games in a row now, including that big tilt this past weekend which may have been a Super Bowl preview, 24-20 to 20 over the Giants. Yeah, and you know, I'd, I'd, if I had to lean one way, I'd probably rank the Steelers a notch ahead of the Ravens, even though they're one game behind them in the standings. It's because they're trending upward, they're starting to get more healthy, right. and the Ravens are just struggling. They're completely beaten up on defense. The offense is just not clicking. And um, like we discussed Going back and forth during the game Sunday, it sure felt like a, a, a Super Bowl matchup, a Super Bowl preview. Um, going back and forth, the Steelers' defense, even without Palomalu, their secondary was all over the place. Um, it doesn't matter who they plug in at running back, Mendenhall, Redmond, um, it, whoever Dwyer. it is. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they just, they're, they're starting to heat up. And, I mean, Redmond looked like uh, second coming of the bus out there running all over the Giants' defense. So, um, and Big Ben makes the plays when they need to. Uh, Mike Wallace, invisible all game. He hits him over the middle. Gone, 51-yard touchdown. So uh, I, I, if I were to lean one way, I'd say the Steelers. But it will be an interesting matchup when they face off again this season. We'll, we'll see who the class of the AFC North is. Yeah, and the, uh, you know, I kind of, you got to feel for the Ravens a little bit because looking at how last season ended and this season they come in, first missing T. Sizzle to start things, then Sizzle's about ready to come back. Ray Lewis goes out, then they lose uh, Ladarius Webb for the year. So, yeah, it's going to be a tough road to hoe for them. And one thing is that we'll see what Flacco is made of because I think that a lot more pressure is going to fall on that offense now because you got the defense, which is used to carrying them, but the defense is only ranked 26th in the league right now as far as total yards per game. Yeah, and uh, Ed Reed can only do so much back there too. Right. Um, teams are, are without Ray Lewis in the middle. I mean, uh, you even saw it earlier in the year when the the lowly Browns started running the ball on that defense, and it caused some people to scratch head. So I don't think it's going to get any easier for them. All right, so you know that's the uh, top three or top three and a half slash four, you may say. But let's go ahead to the most disappointing teams in the uh, AFC for at the midway point. We got the Chargers at 4-4. Four and four. You know, we're blowing that uh, big halftime lead against the Broncos. Uh, the Jets 3-5, and five, but the Chiefs at 1-7, and seven, having lost five in a row. And the interesting stat, the Chiefs have never led a, a game this season. Even the game that they won, they won that in overtime, but they never led the game except in overtime. So they've never led a game in regulation this season. And this was supposed to be something. The Chiefs were... You know, we talk about the trending. They were supposedly trending upward as the season began. But, uh, you know what, let's go ahead and start with the bottom here. That's the Chiefs. What in the world is going on there? You know what, I, I think ultimately um, it boils down to quarterback play. Matt Castle's not getting the job done. He's been hurt. Brady Quinn scares no one. And um, when you have no fear of an aerial game, you're just going to key on Jamal Charles and aside from that one win against the Saints. That's what teams have been doing this year. And uh, on top of that, their defense has been atrocious. Uh, Romeo Cremel demoted himself as defensive coordinator. And just a, just a big mess in Kansas City. And look, I'll raise my hand. I'll accept the blame when I need to. I thought they were going to win that division. I thought they'd have a little bit of an easier road. Um, I thought Castle would rebound after being hurt. I thought Cremel rallied the troops down the stretch last year. They beat Green Bay when they were undefeated. And I was completely wrong. So uh, just a big mess in Kansas City. And, um, you know, if they don't turn it around, which I don't think they will, 
you're going to see some heads roll there right up to the executive suites where uh, Scott Pioli might not be GM much longer. All right, and the Jets, uh, any, is there any way to even analyze the, the mess that this team is in here? I mean, Tebow you know, coming in, they say, may or may not be a distraction. Everybody says it isn't. When I see him, though, he's not even effective in the games in which he plays. He, he seems to come in on offense and just seems to confuse his own team as much as the other, at least. Yeah, and, you know, I thought the Jets were going to be overrated this year. I thought the whole Tebow-Sanchez charade would create a distraction, but even I am disappointed with how disappointing they have become. Um <laughs> They're almost an embarrassment. Look, I know Santonio Holmes is her. Darrell Revis is gone from the year. Hard, hard to rebound from that. But they just seem to, you know, they, they play the Patriots tough, and then Rex is talking about a, you know, almost a moral victory of sorts. I mean, you're really grasping for straws. I, mean, I think that's what's most disappointing. This, this team is just, I don't want to say quit, but there just seems to be no life in them. Rex can't do any more of his guarantees. Um, and then ultimately, Mike Tannenbaum's put this, this team together, and I think he might be the first head to roll there. All right. And, uh, you know, the other team, and we never know what we're going to get from them. Uh, like Forrest Mom said, life is like a box of chocolates, and that is the San Diego Chargers. The Chargers, though, at 4-4, four and four, so even though they've been topsy-turvy up and down, um... They haven't, again, they haven't played themselves out of a playoff spot. So they can still, if they put things together, they can make one of their patented late season runs and maybe get into the playoffs. But uh, the Chargers, uh, what, what's going on there? Yeah, you know, it's deceiving. The wins they have had have not been against great teams. Yeah. Um, you know, I know they think things are turning around because they beat the Chiefs last Thursday night. But, <laughs> I mean, the fourth quarter of that game, it was still within striking distance for the Chiefs to get back in it. They just don't have a quarterback. Um, I, I think they're the most disappointing because this is a year where, now that the Chiefs are out of it, the Raiders are not contenders. Uh, the Broncos could have been had in that first matchup down in San Diego. Uh, this could be the year where they, they, they could string a uh, run together and win this division and get back in the winning winning column. And um, They just seem to take the personality of their coach, Norv Turner, and just kind of lackluster and just I, I just come back to the word underachieving. And uh, Phillip Rivers having a tough time. Um, A.J. Smith just hasn't replaced the departures. He hasn't replaced Vincent Jackson. They've never really gotten a running back to replace Lentady and Tomlinson. Um, and the defense just never seemed to be the same way it was back under Schottenheimer. So, uh, you know, could be another 8-8 eight and eight year, and maybe they clean house there. You hear a lot of rumblings already about uh, Andy Reid possibly ending up there. But, um, you know, not, not sure if he'd even want that job at this point. Yeah, well, and that's the other thing when you talk about uh, the defense back then, you mean back in the good old days when Sean Merriman was still pumped up on steroids and uh, and sacking quarterbacks all over the place. As soon as he was lights off out, the juice, Charles, he was lights done. Lights out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you gotta love a, you gotta love a linebacker who looks like Bluto, you know? Yeah, yeah, but he wasn't on anything, right? <laughs> And, you know, one other team, though, we didn't talk about them. They didn't necessarily make the list. In fact, when we did the pre-production, they, were made, they made the list and then got pushed off by the Chiefs. But the Cincinnati Bengals, another team that was kind of, you know, trending upward as things started. But now you got Marvin Lewis kind of calling out his quarterback publicly. Uh, what, kind of a mess in Cincinnati again. Yeah, I think with them, they had a good year last year. Andy Dalton really emerged nicely as a rookie. Um, A.J. Green is, is seriously becoming a superstar wide receiver that no one knows about. This guy's a monster. And I think ultimately the reason we kind of pushed him back on our list is it's the Bengals. They have this, you know, every five or ten years they have this great season. They get into the playoffs, they're either one and done or they don't make the make a run, and then you don't hear from them again. So they're just reverting back to that Cincinnati Bengals mean um, but, yeah, I, I think there is more to be expected of them this year, and they just have not shown up. Okay, well, you know, they're going to be on uh, one of the teams in our picks segment, which is coming up, by the way. The uh, picks of the week, the segment everybody loves. we got to get right down to it now. So the standings after week nine, we're in a dead heat. Wow. Yours truly at 6-1 and one last week. 
Chris at 5 and 2. We're now both 35 and 19 on the season, and we're getting into these championship weeks, as they call them. So, before we get into the picks segment, uh, anything that you'd like to say, Mr. Lardieri? You know, I knew that uh, Steelers Giants game was going to break my back in more <laughs> ways than one. So, congratulations for catching up to me. Um, I don't know why the the Giants lost to a good team, but for some reason they game bugged me and, and now I know why you've caught up to me <laughs> all right well let's let's go ahead and get uh, get right down to it the Lions uh, topsy-turvy Lions four and four going into Minnesota to play the Vikings Vikings at five and four and the Vikings with their team name misspelled on my screen right here it says the Vikings I don't know maybe I was thinking about Michael Vick as I wrote that down but <laughs> <laughs> the Lions at the Vikings uh, how do you see that one? You know, these are two teams from week to week. You don't know who's going to show up. I know Minnesota went into Seattle last week, and the only guy who seemed to show up was Adrian Peterson running all over the place for 180-plus yards. Um, the Lions, yeah, they beat up on the hapless Jaguars, but who knows what will happen this week. Um, going with the Vikings, I just think they play well at Minnesota. I think the Lions seem to be up one week, down another. Uh, trending downward this week. And on sort of a personal side note, my uh, wife, Ann Connie, unfortunately passed away. She uh, lived in the Minneapolis area, and for selfish reasons and for her family, Dick and Brenda, I hope the Vikings win for you guys. So uh, she was a great woman, and you uh, Purple Vikings better win for her, and you better win for my record this week. How about that, okay? <laughs> there you go. And hey, you know what? <laughs> Who can go against something like that? You know what a what a great uh, you know great story behind there, and I'm sure that Adrian Peterson all day he's going to run for at least 150 yards in her honor. And I am taking the Vikings as well because the Lions have not they've not shown me anything yet this season, really nothing. Yeah. They're they're week to week ups and down, just not strong on offense, not strong on defense. Calvin Johnson isn't really doing anything. Uh, Domicong Sue and uh, Nick Fairley and all these, all the great uh, defensive linemen, they're not doing anything. I don't know what's going on there in Detroit, but it's not good, and there's no way to beat the Vikings this week. You know, I hope there's some good purple karma. And then uh, on a side note, you know, no one's talking about this comeback Adrian Peterson has yeah. made. I mean, people had him written off for the whole season, and, and look at this guy. He's back in almost rookie form after – tearing up his knee in the week 16 last year. I mean, uh, more people need to, to get on this bandwagon. I mean, I, he keeps it up. He's going to come back player of the year locked up. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, too bad somebody should have broken his leg in his first season or something like that. Imagine the running back he would have become. Yeah. Well, doesn't yeah. fumble anymore either. Yes, this is true. He's, David Wilson needs to go take some lessons from him. <laughs> okay, so we agree on that game, but now we got the 8-0 Falcons at New Orleans to play the Saints. The Saints, you know, 3 and 5, not yeah, not completely out of it, but definitely uh, teetering on life support here. The Mighty Falcons going in and as we were talking in pre-production, real good chance maybe the Falcons if they get by this game, they've really only got the Giants or their only tough game way down the road here. 8 and 0 right now, the Falcons halfway to 16 and 0. How do you see this one? You know, if this were last year, I would pick the Saints in an upset, but the Saints have no defense. I know they've turned it around and gone 3-1 and one since the rough start, but um, even if it's a close game, I don't see them having any sort of ability to stop all the weapons the Falcons have. Um, and I, I just think the Falcons go in there. They're, they're kind of on a roll. They, they've, you know, I don't want to say slipped up against Dallas, but you know, Dallas made it interesting at the end. So I think they're going to take every opponent pretty darn seriously now and uh they should continue the undefeated trend yeah when i look at this game too i mean for all the reasons you just said no reason to even overanalyze it the falcons are the better team new orleans can give up points to any team out there in fact this past game this past week against uh, the eagles the eagles could have won that game but the Eagles wanted to turn the ball over more than the Saints wanted to give them the game, so ultimately the Saints win that game. No way the Falcons play that sloppy, and I'm taking the Falcons in this. Falcons, I think they're going to hang 40 in the Superdome. 40. We can do the dirty bird then. <laughs> okay. 
And uh, let's go ahead and down to your Giants little interconference uh, matchup here. Giants at six and three, Bengals at three and five again. Bengals win this one. They're at four and five. They lose it. They go to three and six, and pretty much playoff picture is done for them. How do you see this? I see the Giants winning. They're heading into a bye week. They're probably sick of Tom Coughlin drilling them this week for really the third consecutive mediocre performance on, uh, especially on the offensive side of the ball. And uh, what better way to uh, head into a bye week than play the Bungles? Uh, I think they'll win. Um, Will they do it resoundingly? I don't know with the way this offense has been playing and how erratic defense has been at times. But um, with the way Dalton's been turning the ball over and the way the Giants have brought back a, a couple for touchdowns in the last few weeks, it could be the difference right there. Well, I'll just say this. Um, you have the defending Super Bowl champs playing against the Bengals. That is all. Giants. Let's go on to the next game. <laughs> The Titans 3-6 and six at the Dolphins. Dolphins had won three in a row. They stumbled a little bit, even though they didn't play bad against Indy. But, you know, Dolphins lost the game. Dolphins are 4-4 four and four now. But they got good run defense, and Chris Johnson is sort of trying to get back into form. How do you see this one shaping up? I think the Dolphins rebound. They win. Um, like you said, their defense is very underrated. Um, they're really on offense. The only thing that would scare you is Chris Johnson, depending on which one shows up. I think the Dolphins shut them down, and then I think on offense they'll probably uh, grind the ball away with Reggie Bush and then uh, mix in a little bit of Tannehill passing. might not be the most exciting shootout kind of game, but uh, I, I think the Dolphins put them away. Yeah, and i got to go with the Dolphins, too. The Dolphins being, you know, at this point, the more complete team on both sides of the ball, and especially on offense. Uh, you know, you're looking at, like you said, the running, the passing, they got more weapons. They got a more balanced team, and they're playing better football. I go with the Dolphins as well. Next game up, the Jets going into Seattle. Seattle with that vaunted 12th man advantage. Jets at three and five. Seahawks at five and four. How do you see that one? Seattle. They just, for whatever reason, seem to be unbeatable up there, and um, I do not see the Jets flying 3,000 plus miles and winning in that environment. Um, really, like you said earlier, no need to overanalyze it. Um, I think, if anything, Marshawn Lynch will probably run all over the Jets, um, and Russell Wilson will probably get even more confident after another victory. So if I were to set the over-under for Marshawn Lynch, if I set it at 104 yards, would you take the over or the under? Oh, I'll take the over. <laughs> <laughs> As would unless, I. And, and, yeah, unless he gets lost on the way to the stadium. He's got he's got to show up. Let's just make that clear. All right. I got the Seahawks in this one, too. So, you know, the picks have been kind of easy up to this point, but we're getting to the last two, which are going to be difficult picks, but for kind of opposite reasons here. First, we're going to get to the, uh, how we call it, the Battle of the Bunglers, maybe? The Cowboys at 3-5 and five, at the Eagles who are also 3-5. and five. You know, the loser of this game is basically out of the playoff hunt. They're done. So you got, uh, we set the over-under for, for turnovers in the game at, say, I don't know, 7.5. I don't know if I'd take the over-under, but go ahead and uh, shoot me some analysis here. Yeah, um, between Romo and Vic, the defense will be busy on both sides this week. Um, that said, I'm going with the Eagles mainly because they're home. Um, I think they played a little better offensively until the turnovers kicked in on Monday night in New Orleans. But um, I just think that uh, for whatever reason, this could be the very last week that Vic's a starter in Philadelphia. Um, for me, I'm just thinking maybe something will click in his head and he'll, he'll have a good performance. He'll snap out of it like he did uh, earlier this season. But um, you never know. This is one of those flip-of-the-coin games. And selfishly, if the Cowboys lose, I think it would just be so fascinating to have the media firestorm continue down in Big D. <laughs> okay, well, you know what? I got to I gotta go ahead and agree with you again here. And for – at a certain point, the Eagles have to play a decent ball game here. And uh, when I say decent, I mean just decent, not great or anything. But the Eagles have lost four in a row now. The Cowboys have lost two in a row. Neither team knows how to play good, consistent football. 
But I, I got to go with the Eagles and a little bit of home field advantage and think that Vic at some point has to stop turning the ball over. That'll happen this week, I think. So I'm going with the Eagles as well. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, if you look at both sides of the ball, I'll take LaShawn McCoy over Felix Jones and think that'll probably be the difference right there. There we go. Okay, so let's get to the last game here, which is going to be uh, it's a Sunday night tilt. The Texans at 7-1 and one against the Bears in Chicago. Bears also 7-1. and one. Now, the Bears with that defense, which is really – got to see how Cutler's going to do without the defense giving him the ball in great field position or scoring, you know, getting pick sixes or anything because I think the Texans are going to take care of the ball here. So this game, I think, will show a lot about both of these 7-1 and one teams. It may unmask one and it may solidify one or it may just show that they're both really great teams. Talk to me. Yeah, it's a really interesting game. Um, I've gone back and forth with how I think it could go. And um, ultimately, I'm going to pick the Bears. I think their defense is just clicking on all cylinders right now, save for uh, Charles Tillman, who might end up missing the game due to the uh, upcoming birth of his child. And I know the, uh, the the cackling hens at the Bristol Improv, a.k.a. ESPN, at a field day milking this today. Um, you know, Like I said to you in pre-production, it's, not like Sandy Koufax uh, missing a World Series game due to his uh, religious beliefs, but um, <laughs> you know, with or without Tillman, um, I just think the uh, the Bears have kind of got some momentum. While I do think the the Texans defense is stout, could be a low scoring game, could see some turnovers between these two quarterbacks, Cutler and Schaub. But uh, at the end of the day, I think the the like you mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. the Texans can't get the ball through the air to Andre Johnson this year. And if they shut down Foster, the, the Bears' defense, I think that could be the difference, and I could see that happening. All right. Well, you know what? It, it had to happen at some point. And finally, with the picks, we have the game that we disagree on. <laughs> and I think that what's going to happen is Houston is going to take care of the football. And the Houston's defense, I think, is the type of defense that really they can frustrate Jay Cutler. When I look at the way that he's played, you got J.J. Swat up there, you know, batting everything out of the air. And that's starting to infect the rest of the defensive linemen as well. They play solid defense. Uh, both teams do. But I think it's going to come down, you look at the quarterback play. I know they got Matt Forte in the backfield there in Chicago and, and Foster. Which one stops, which one better. But when it just narrowest of margins, I tend to like the poise of Matt Schaub a little bit better than the poise of Cutler. And this is going to be one of those games, I think, where Cutler's not going to get the ball in great field position three or four times a game like he's used to because I don't think Houston's going to turn the ball over, and I think that'll be the difference in this game. So Houston probably by three or four points, I'd say, in this game. Yeah, I can't say I'd be surprised if Houston wins. I really do think it'll be a good game. I'd be surprised if it's lopsided one way or the other. All right, perfect. That's the uh, picks of the week, and that kind of wraps things up here for our Week 10 show. We did the AFC preview. Uh, Mr. Lardieri, before we uh, go off the air here, everybody knows it's my birthday on November 9th. The, the gifts and emails and everything have been flooding in, so I do thank everyone out there. And uh, likewise, happy birthday to you tomorrow. And my dad, you share a birthday uh, with my dad. And uh, two great football fans. He's a huge Giants fan, season ticket holder. Um, I hope they show up for you this week and play in Cincinnati, Dad, because I know the last few weeks have been pretty aggravating. All right, there we go. So on behalf of Chris Lardieri and also Pops Lardieri, this is Charles E. Smith, Jr., just a couple of things. Thanks for watching Football Talk, and remember, Scorpio power. We'll see you all next week. Thanks.